for everyone. In this series, A Climate of Peace, the Sydney Peace Foundation will be interviewing leading thinkers, academics and change makers about the link between climate action and peace with justice. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Emeritus Professor Frank Stillwell from the Department of Political Economy at Sydney University. Professor Stillwell is on the executive of the Council for Peace with Justice and is vice president of the Evatt Foundation. He's also the author of more than 10 books and his latest, The Polit Political Economy of Inequality. He also recently contributed an article titled Snapback or Press On from the Par Current Crisis to a Green New Deal. That article was published in the Journal of Australian Political Economy. In the article, Professor Stillwell puts the case for dealing with a deteriorating climate as part of the journey to economic recovery. Uh, Professor Stillwell, welcome to A Climate of Peace. It's a pleasure. Um, Professor, I, I want to discuss first inequality. Um, in your recent book, The Polit Political Economy of Inequality, you say, concern with the distribution of income and wealth as a central place in strategies for social progress in the real world. You, your focus is on distribution of wealth rather than wealth creation. Why do you frame the discussion that way? Well, I guess if you look back into human history, uh, the eradication of poverty was always the, the justification for economic growth. And so the focus on the creation of wealth, producing more things, generating more incomes, uh, accumulating more wealth, is quite understandable in historical context. But I think essentially that economic problem has now been solved. The production problem is now much less important than the distribution problem. Because we, we've got this world that is so terribly unequal between nations and within nations. The gap between rich and poor is so wide and shows little sign in general of, of, of closing. And so though we're capable as, as a species of producing enormous amounts of stuff, generating income and wealth, we simply haven't solved the problem of distributing it fairly so that uh, we all share in that wealth, at least to, to some extent. The, the gap between the insiders and the outsiders is a source of so much social conflict. Uh, it, uh, and I'll also argue that it's the source of considerable environmental stress. We might see some of that conflict playing out in the United States at the moment. Mm, yes. You go into your book, though, to talk about the environment, you say the exploitation of nature is a particularly pervasive thing. Tell us a bit more about your fears for equality and peace if we continue to exploit nature. Well, I mean, we're faced with this uh, incredible challenge uh, of climate change. If we can't solve this, frankly, the, the future of humankind on this planet is looking very bleak, and as indeed is the future of many other species too. Um, the, the first signs of uh, the impending disaster are already upon us. Um, extreme weather events, associated problems of droughts, of bushfires, um, possibly changing uh, environment in which different kinds of health problems will Im impact on, on society. Certainly there'll be growing uh, numbers of climate refugees, particularly in our region with so many low-lying countries in the Pacific, but more generally, we'll find greater pressures of people wanting to move between countries in response to problems arising from a changing climate. But we'll see uh, authoritarian governments trying to bring down the portcullis and uh, pull up the drawbridge to uh, insulate themselves, and in particular, uh, insulate the wealthy from the increased problems associated by the poor and marginalised. This is a pretty awesome prospect uh, for humankind in general, and in particular for peaceful relations uh, within people of different class, different race, different gender, ethnicity, different nationality. Uh, if we can't solve this one, 
then the uh, future does indeed look very bleak. Well, you sound like a, you sound a bit pessimistic there, uh, Professor, but... Well, the, there's a lovely line, Steve, which I came across in my reading the other day, which said, look, the situation is far too serious and it's far too late to be pessimistic. <laughs> you and your colleagues, Professor Stowell, um, create, uh, wrote some articles for a special uh, edition of the Journal of Political Economy. Um, you wrote an article that was about the Green New Deal. We'll come to that. You started it by saying, never let a crisis go to waste. I hope that was an optimistic thought. Um, <laughs> can, you share, can you share your thoughts about the competing ideas that economists have for policies that will create prosperity on the other side of the COVID pandemic? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I use that phrase, uh, never let a crisis go to waste uh, for good reason. Um, it's more typically used politically on the right uh, to indicate a situation where if, if, if the, uh, the economy is in disarray, then you can do uh, some radical things that couldn't be done in normal circumstances. Uh, like bailout banks and things. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, that, but also as, as Naomi Klein, Klein argued in one of her books about uh, Hurricane Katrina, they took the opportunity in the United States in, in New Orleans to completely transform the education system. Now that got nothing to do with the impact of the hurricane, but in a situation of crisis, governments sometimes take the opportunity to push through changes that have been resisted by people in normal times. People in Australia are currently talking about, you know, um, uh, bringing forward the income tax cuts for the wealthy that are scheduled to come on, on stream in a, a year or two's time. Uh, in other words, take the opportunity uh, uh, under the guise of talking about the need to incentivize and increase production uh, of, of making tax cuts for the wealthy, or perhaps for um, in, introducing new industrial relations reforms that will further curtail the power of trade unions. Uh, that, that, that's what I mean about uh, the right wing grasping opportunities in crises to drive uh, harder versions of a neoliberal agenda. But, uh, but I, I, I think people on the progressive side of uh, political economic debates can also seize the moment. And that's why I've been pushing very strongly the idea of a Green New Deal. In other words, at a time when people do need jobs, but we also need uh, more sustainable policies for the environment and we need a fairer society, we could, if we had the political will and support, drive through a program that was job creating, uh, particularly of green jobs, jobs that would actually enhance our environmental credentials rather than continue that sort of extractivist process of production and ensure that we had a fairer tax system, fairer structure of uh, uh, government expenditures, perhaps even a uni universal basic wage, uh, 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 which is not dependent upon the amount of work that's done. Th these are the sorts of progressive reforms that could be introduced and frankly I think could be very popular at a time when people are, are desperate for some vision of, of a post-COVID-19 society that is worth struggling for. So I'm not much of an economist, Frank, as you know, because I studied with you, but um, Keynes I studied at, at school 40 years ago. And of course, Keynes said, when you're in a recession or a depression, it's government's, government's role is to spend money. So what are you, are you saying that government could choose to spend money on? Absolutely. The, the, the current government in Australia is already doing so uh, in a way that would have been unimaginable six months ago. It was talking about um, running a budget surplus. Well, that's completely out the window. We're, we're now running the biggest budget deficit in, in Australia's history. So 
Uh, and, and that has been driven by the force of circumstance. In other words, that the government has already em embraced the Keynesian policies of big spending to try to stimulate the economy and a, so as to avoid a, a, an even deeper recession than the one we're currently experiencing. All I'm saying is that a progressive version of, of that a government spending Keynesian approach should now emphasize the creation of green jobs, changing our transport infrastructure, changing our energy systems so that these are sustainable and don't have adverse climate change impacts. This is the golden opportunity, it seems to me, to have that comprehensive, progressive reform agenda to create a more sustainable and equitable society. Well, let's see what happens when the governments open the purse strings, Professor Stillwell. We're asking, people, asking the, the, our interviewees the same two questions. The first one is, how do you see the consequences for a peaceful and just society of a continued failure to address climate change? Well, things are going to get very tough if uh, we can't address climate change. Uh, but I think it has to be done in conjunction with addressing inequality too because it's, it's that combination that makes the problem so seemingly intractable. But if we could get a fairer society, I think we would get more willingness of people across different walks of life to cooperate in restructuring the way in which we produce and consume things. We could have more uh, local production for local consumption based around cooperative organisations that weren't based on the exploitation of labour or on the exploitation of nature. So this is why I think if we can just get those two things at, to the top of the political agenda, sustainability and equity, then we can make real progress in a situation that otherwise looks rather dire. Mm. And so the last question, I know you're an economist, you, you're not an environmentalist. Um, if there was one action you could take to move towards a safer climate for everybody, what do you think it should be? Well, following what I've just been arguing, the embrace of a Green New Deal policy would be wonderful. But even short of that, just to close down the coal mining and coal exports in Australia would be a huge step. It couldn't be done overnight. There would have to be a transition. There would need to be a just transition so that people who lost their jobs in that process would get retraining, new jobs in, in other sustainable economic activities. But we could get started on a Green New Deal by focusing on exactly that transformation of our energy system. And I think it's absolutely tragic that to date the major political parties and the coalition in particular, which has been our government for so many years, has been unable to move forward on this front. We're just starting to look like a, a global pariah rather than a global exemplar that we should and could be. Well, Professor, it's been a joy to share a few minutes with you on a climate of peace. Um, I know you've retired from teaching, but I see from your writing, you haven't retired from thinking and contributing to our society. And we thank you on behalf of the City Peace Foundation for joining us today. And thank you and uh, to everyone associated with the Sydney Peace Foundation, which is a, a great institution and long may it flourish.